Hey everybody, welcome back to RPG Rookies, where we cover Dungeons and Dragons, tabletop role-playing games, dungeon crawlers, and all things fantasy. I am your dungeon minion. You heard right, I said minion, because I'm certainly no master. Today we're going to have another review. Today I'm going to be reviewing this product right here, the Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition Dungeon Master's Guide. And this right here is another book that players who are getting into the hobby are going to absolutely need to to add to their collection, especially if they want to pursue the option of being a dungeon master. Even if you're not going to be a dungeon master, I do think that eventually owning this uh, product would be very helpful to give you a deeper understanding of the game of D&D, and in particular of the other side of the game from the dungeon master's perspective. So this right here, is the second book in the core book set. Uh, we have the Player's Handbook, which I covered last week on the channel, so make sure to check that video out. And there's also the Monster's Manual, which would be the third book in this series of core books, uh, The probably the third most important book. Uh, this here, I would say, is the second most important book. And I'm going to open it up here and go through a little flip through here and show you guys the contents of the this book. So first of all, we have the uh, artwork here, very appropriate for the Dungeon Master. Uh, and here we're going to open it up and see what's, it's, what's inside. We have a table of contents, of course, uh, telling us uh, everything, uh, all the different chapters and where things can be found. And then it gives us here a little introduction. It says, it's good to be the dungeon master. Not only do you tell, get to tell fantastic stories about heroes, villains, monsters, and magic, but you also get to create the world in which these stories live. Whether you're running a D&D game already, or you think it's something you want to try, this book is for you. The Dungeon Master's Guide assumes that you know the basics of how to play D&D tabletop role-playing game. If you haven't played before, the Dungeons & Dragons starter set is a great starting point for new players and DMs, and I have covered that product on this channel as well, the Dungeons & Dragons uh, starter set. And then it goes into detail about the Dungeon Master and how to use this book. So then we go straight into part one of the book, which is the Master of Worlds section. And for chapter one, it starts with a world of your own, and it gives you the big picture and some core assumptions about the worlds you'll be creating and running. First of all, the fact that gods oversee the world, the fact that much of the world is untamed, the fact that the world is ancient, the fact that conflict shapes the world's history, and finally the fact that the world is magical. We have a description here about the gods of your world, the pantheons that may exist in this world, other religious systems such as mystery cults and monotheism, dualism, animism. We have the humanoids and gods. Then here it talks about mapping your campaign. It talks about province scale and kingdom scale and continent scale. It talks to you about combining scales. Then it goes into detail about settlements here. Okay, it talks about the size. And then we have different sizes for your locations. You have your village, uh, which has a population of about 1,000. Then you have your towns, which have a population of about up to 6,000. Then you have your cities, which have a population of about 25,000. Talk to you about atmosphere and government, different forms of government that you might find. Right? Bureaucracy, confederacy, democracy, dictatorship, of course. It talks about currency, uh, the common coinage that you'll find in the Forgotten Realms, for example. Uh, the odd currency. It talks about creating your own currency. Then it goes into detail about languages and dialects, factions and organizations, adventurers and organizations. It talks about renown. Renown is an optional rule you can use to track an adventurer's standing within a particular faction or organization. Then it talks about magic in your world. It talks about different schools of magic, the restrictions of magic, including being able to bring back the dead. 
And then here we start talking about creating a campaign and it suggests that you start small. You create a home base, you create a local region and you craft a starting adventure. Of course, you have to set the stage, create a background and then put the events into motion. Then we have this section here on play styles and the different dungeon masters and the different players are going to have different game styles that they gravitate towards. So for example, here we have the ever so popular hack and slash. It says here the adventurers kick in the dungeon door. They fight the monsters and grab the treasure. This style of play is straightforward, fun, exciting, and action oriented. At the same time, this style of play is not necessarily for everybody. And then it talks about a style of play that perhaps Perhaps is uh, something in between hack and slash and immersive storytelling because the immersive storytelling as they describe it is more about engaging in that world and discovering and exploring that world and doing more than just uh, hack and slash or combat. It talks about continuing or episodic campaigns and then it talks about the tiers of play, breaking them up uh, through different levels. So levels 1 through 4 would be a local hero while levels 17 to 20 would be masters of the world. It talks about the different flavors of fantasy including heroic fantasy, sword and sorcery, epic fantasy, and mythic fantasy. Fantasy. You have dark fantasy, intrigue, mystery, swashbuckling, war, wuxia, and then it talks a little bit about crossing the streams here. Then in chapter two, we have creating a multiverse, and it talks to you about planes and putting the planes together. It talks to you about planar travel, the planar portals. And we have a description on some of the different planes. We have the astral plane here. Uh, we have the ethereal plane. We have the Feywild. We have Shadowfell. We have the inner planes, the elemental chaos, the plane of air, the plane of earth, the plane of fire, and of course the plane of water. Then we have the outer planes. I really like this uh, depiction here, this image here. Uh, the outer planes. It talks about the layers of the outer planes and traveling the out outer planes. Mount Celestia, B Bitopia, uh, Elysium, Arborea, Isgard, Pan Pandemonium, the Abyss, Carcery, Gehenna, the Nine Hells, Acheron, Mechanus, Arcadia. Then it talks about other planes, the Outlands and Sigils, the Demiplanes, the Far Realm, the Known World of the Material Plane. And then finally, we move on to part two of the book, which is Master of Adventures. And here it talks about actually creating individual adventures. It talks about the elements of a great adventure. We need a credible threat, familiar tropes with clever twists, a clear focus on the present. Heroes who matter, something for all player types, and surprises. Of course, we need surprises. And here it talks about published adventures that players can use and purchase in order to use to run their adventures or to borrow ideas from. It talks about the adventure structure from beginning, middle, and end. Different adventure types. Some are location-based adventures. Some would be event-based adventures. Talks about framing events, moral quandaries. Then it talks about side quests. It's not all about the main objectives. Sometimes these little side quests are a good little distraction from the actual uh, main objectives and are a good little uh, something to sprinkle into your adventure to add excitement and twists. So we have that. Uh, it talks about character objectives, creating a combat encounter. talks about fun combat encounters, random encounters, talks about creating random encounter tables. Then in chapter four, we have creating non-player characters and the non-player characters typically referred to as NPCs are a very important part of of the world of Dungeons and Dragons. It's not just about the characters, it's about, or the heroes, it's about NPCs, uh, characters that are controlled or uh, 
reenacted by the dungeon master himself or herself uh, who add flavor and depth to this world uh, that the heroes are exploring. And it talks to you about designing NPCs, uh, de detailed NPCs as opposed to quick NPCs, um, their talents and mannerisms, their interactions with others, the fact that just like regular player characters, they're going to have ideals, they're going to have bonds, and they're going to have flaws or secrets. Uh, it talks here a little bit about monsters as NPCs. Uh, then it talks about NPC statistics, NPCs as party members, NPCs as low-level followers, as patrons, as hirelings, as extras, and even as villains. Then it even includes some class options for villains, including the clerics of the Death Domain and the paladins of the Oathbreaker subclass. Then we move on to chapter 5, which talks about adventure environments. It talks about dungeons, which the name of the game says it all. Dungeons and Dragons. Quite often it's the most typical and stereotypical setting that people envision for uh, an adventure environment. It talks to you about building a dungeon. A table here for dungeon creator, for cults and religious groups, for NPC alignment and NPC class. Uh, dungeon purpose, dungeon history, the inhabitants of the dungeon. Uh, it talks about mapping a dungeon and different features that you'll find in a dungeon, including walls and doors and secret doors. And here we have a little uh, example, a little sample of a dungeon here, the catacombs. It talks about concealed doors, darkness and light, air quality in a dungeon, sounds that you might hear in a dungeon, hazards that you might encounter in a dungeon, including slime and webs and yellow mold. Then it talks about another adventure environment, which is the wilderness, uh, which is probably my favorite adventure setting. I love uh, adventures that take place in the wilderness here. Uh, it tells you about two different approaches, a travel montage approach or an hour-by-hour hour approach. It talks about mapping a wilderness, the movement on the map, the different features that you'll find, including monster lairs and monuments and ruins and settlements and weird locales and strongholds. It talks to you about wilderness survival and weather. Weather is an element because now you are in the outdoors. So that's something to consider. Things such as extreme cold, extreme heat, wind, precipitation, high altitude, and other wilderness uh, hazards here. It talks about foraging and perhaps becoming lost. Now here we talk about settlements. Settlements are another uh, adventure setting you can have here. Uh, it talks about uh, random settlements and random buildings. Mapping a settlement, uh, urban encounters, uh, things that you will deal in a settlement or in a city setting, such as law and order, trials, sentences. Uh, let's see here. Then it talks about unusual environments, such as underwater, the sea. The sky, for example, can be an unusual setting. Talks here about traps. How they can be triggered, detected, and disabled. Gives you a few options here for different traps. Then we move on to chapter 6, which talks about what to do in between adventures. It's not all about the questing. Also, what happens in between one adventure and the other. It gives you some tips on how to link adventures together, how to weave them together. Uh, planting seeds for adventures, foreshadowing, and campaign tracking. It also talks about reoccurring or recurring expenses that players will have to account for when they're budgeting their wealth and their treasure. It talks about some downtime activities that will take place in between adventures. Uh, such as building a stronghold or perhaps crafting magic items, running a business maybe even. Uh, tells you about sellable or saleable magic items, how you sell my magic items. Training that takes place in order to gain levels. Then chapter number seven moves on to treasure and it tells you about the different types of treasure. Primarily we have coins, but we also have gemstones and art objects and magic items. Random treasure here tells you about treasure tables, 
And here it gives you a list of different tables for gemstones. Uh, and here we have some magic items. It talks about buying and selling, identifying a magic item. Now some of these magic items might be cursed items. So that's something to keep in mind. It talks about activating an item and some of the special features of these items. Then we have multiple tables here of different random magic items. Then we have a detailed list of magic items from A through Z, starting with the adamantine armor and working its way through with lots of different uh, options here. Armor of invulnerability, the bag of devouring over here. We have bag of tricks, the belt of dwarven kind. We have the boots of striding, the candle of invocation, the cape of the mountebank. We have the Sensor of Controlling Air Elementals, the Cloak of Displacement. We have the Crystal Ball, the Cloak of Protection, the Cloak of the Manta Ray, the Cube of Force Faces, the Dancing Sword, the Dagger of Venom. We have here the ever so famous Deck of Many Things. Uh, what else do we have here? The... Avatar of Death, the Demon Armor, the Dragon Slayer, we have the Dwarven Plate, we have the Figurine of Wondrous Power, Oof, we have the Flame Tongue over here, we have the Helm of Comprehending Languages, that could be very useful, the Helm of Brilliance. We have here the Hammer of Thunderbolts. We have the Helm of Telepathy. The Horn of Valhalla. How about that? We've got the Kanaf Mandolin. We have the Iron Bands of Bilaro. We have the Mace of Smiting and the Luck Blade. We have the Javelin of Lightning here. We have the Manual of Flesh Golems, the Manual of Quickness of Action, and, and the Manual of Bodily Health. We have the Nine Lives Stealer Sword and the Oath Bow. We have the Pipes of the Sewers. We have the Bird Token and the Quiver of Elonia or Elona. We have the Ring of Evasion, the Ring of Animal Influence. The Ring of Regeneration, the Ring of X-Ray Vision, tons of rings. Uh, the D&D world is very big into jewelry. <laughs> we have the Robe of Stars and the Rod of Absorption. We have the Robe of Useful Items, the Rod of Rulership, the Rod of Resurrection. We have the Sending Stones and the Scarab of Protection. We have the Spell Guard Shield and the Sovereign Glue. We have the Staff of Healing, the Staff of Swarming Insects, the Staff of the Magi. We have the Sunblade, we have the Staff of the Woodlands, and the Staff of Withering. We have the Sword of Sharpness and the Sword of Life Stealing, the Talisman of the Sphere, and the Talisman of Ultimate Evil. We have the Tentacle Rod and the Vicious Weapon, the Vorpal Sword, and the Trident of Fish Command. We have the Wand of Polymorph, the Wand of Fireballs, the Wand of Secrets, the Wand of Paralysis, the Wand of Web, the Well of Many Worlds, and that's it. I think we're done with that list of uh, magic items here. We have sentient uh, magic items. We've got the Black Razor here and the Moonblade, and we have the Wave and the Whelm. We have some artifacts here. Talks about destroying artifacts. We have the Book of Exalted Deeds, the Book of Vile Darkness, the Orb of Dragon Kind. It talks here about other rewards that players can gain. It talks about marks of prestige, letters of recommendation, charms, medals, parcels of land even, special favors that they can earn, special rights, strongholds, and even titles that can be attributed to them as rewards. And of course we have uh, training as well. We have Epic Boons, and Epic Boon is a special power available only to 20th level characters.
Then here we have part three, the master of rules. And here it talks about actually running the game. It talks about table talk, dice rolling, uh, missing players, the metagame thinking. Uh, goes into detail about small groups and new players and sometimes ignoring the dice using the different ability scores. It talks here about inspiration. It says awarding inspiration is an effective way to encourage role playing and risk taking. As explained in the player's handbook, having inspiration gives a character an obvious benefit. Being able to gain advantage on one ability check, attack roll, or saving throw. Remember that a character can have no more than one inspiration at a time. As a rule of thumb, aim to award inspiration to each character about once per session of play. Over time, you might want to award inspiration more or less often at a rate that works best for your table. You might use the same rate for your entire DMing career, or you might change it with each campaign. It talks here about combat, tracking a monster's hit points, using and tracking conditions, monsters, and critical hits. Here it talks about improvising damage. A monster typically specifies the amount of damage it deals, but in some cases, you're going to need to determine the damage on the fly, and it gives you a table to improvise that damage here. It talks to you about using miniatures and tactical maps. Here we have a section that talks to you about diseases and poisons. It talks to you about madness, going mad, and the effects of madness. Then we move on to chapter 9 here, which is the Dungeon Master's Workshop. It says this chapter contains optional rules that you can use to customize your campaign, as well as guidelines on creating your own material, such as monsters and magic items. And then it gives you lots of different uh, descriptions of different things that you can do uh, as far as that's concerned. And this is a pretty long and detailed section uh, of the book here. Then finally, we close with the appendices. And here we have appendix number A. And it talks about random dungeons here. And you got maze and strongholds and temples or shrines. You got tombs. You got treasure vaults. You got dungeon chambers. You got lairs. You got planar gates. You got depth traps. You got mines. Um, let's see here. We got chambers. Here it talks about monster motivation and obstacles and trap effects and dungeon hazards that you'll find in your dungeon. Uh, random treasures and dungeon dre uh, dressing here. The tables in the section provide miscellaneous items and points of interest that can be placed in your dungeon. And there's a long list of noises, of air conditions, of odors, of general features, of furnishings and appointments that you can find in your randomized dungeon. Some religious articles, some ma uh, mage furnishings, some utensils and personal items, container contents, books, scrolls, and tomes, of course. Then we move on to Appendix B, which are monster lists. And it talks about different types of monsters, including Arctic monsters, coastal monsters, desert monsters, forest monsters, uh, grassland monsters, hill monsters, mountain monsters, swamp monsters, underdog monsters, urban monsters. Then it delineates the monsters by challenge rating. So we have uh, monsters all the way from challenge zero to challenge three over here. And then over here we have challenge five all the way to challenge 30. Then we have Appendix C, which is uh, a few diagrams of different maps and dungeons that you can use as a sample size here. And then we have Appendix D, the Dungeon Master Inspiration. And that's it as far as the contents of this book here, the Dungeons and Dragons 5th Edition Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, that's it for our video today. Again, if you want to check the player's handbook flip through and review that we did a week ago, please check that out on the channel. Comment down below and tell me what you think about today's video and in particular this product right here, the D&D 5th Edition Dungeon Master's Guide. Thank you so much for joining us here at RPG Rookies, everybody. Take care. See you next time. Bye-bye.